took us a while, this one, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're in a giggly mood. I'm this sorry. is not going to go I'm well. I'm just laughing at us. Really nothing. Hi everyone, welcome back to Doctor Who Review. Uh, today filmed a little further away because I have to be close to a charger because this camera is is cheap and dying. Um, and I am lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Lou's working on a bunch of craft stuff, so you can probably see if you, if you always have the visual of this on in the background, you don't just listen in a tab. There is a say, Lou's working on a bunch of crap. <laughs> you're always working on a bunch of shit. And, uh, there's a sleeping cat in the background. If I move the TARDIS, there's a sleeping dog too. Um, and I can sleep too if you want. You can have a sleep too if you want through this one. Okay, night. Uh, welcome back. I'm Chris. I'm not Chris. Yeah, I don't know who this Lou is. I mentioned a second ago. <laughs> and we're here to finish what I wrote call at the time, kind of referring to as the worst series of Doctor Who I'd ever watched up to that point. Now, I hadn't watched all the classic run, but I still, after we finished our classic run, had fonder feelings for each individual season than I did for this. However, we've been on a bit of a journey with this one. Um, Magician's Apprentice, which is familiar, still shite. Some fun, but still shite. Yeah. Under the Lake Before the Flood, pretty great overall. Disappointing sort of wrap-up, but pretty great. Is that the one where... Um... Ghosts. And um, the... <laughs> The, the Fisher King's CGI flying at the camera when the wave hit him, and it looked really weird, like he T posed <laughs> yeah. at the camera. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, the God, what was next? Oh, the the girl who died and the woman who lived. Preferred the girl who died. Did not care very much for the woman who lived. Rude. Um, Zygon invasion. Zygon inversion. I can appreciate more now after separating it from the absolute internet fan community fan wank around it when it came out. And that scene, go watch our review of that to find out how much that annoys me. But I enjoyed that story more this time around. Um, and then are we into these ones? I think we are from there, aren't we? Yeah. Sleep no more. Um, one of the last ones written by Mark Gatto. Mark Gatto? Um, Our good friend Mark Gatto. Friend of the show. He's never seen this. He's no, um, he, he, he remembers you. He wouldn't remember me. He's a lovely man. He's a lovely, lovely man. I have to emphasise that. Because this ain't his strongest script for the show. Well, let's just... yeah. That, now, now. The idea and the execution of the script, I think, is brilliant. I genuinely... I am... I am... A sleep no more apologist. I am a sleep no more defender. This episode, more than any other this series, was torn to shreds when it came out. People hated this one. To shreds, you say? To shreds, you say. <laughs> they, How did Mark take it? To shreds, you say. <laughs> they tore this one to pieces, and I don't get it. You don't get why it was torn to pieces? I don't get it. I see why it's not to everybody. I think, the, again... As always with this, we assume you've seen the episode, so spoilers are plenty. The fact that the monsters are sleep is a bit... Wait, what? Dumb. At least in the form they take. The fact that they're just giant sand men is a bit boring. You know what I mean? I like, am... like, if they were a disease or a virus, <laughs> or they mutated to the point where they could... Um, rewrite people from the inside <laughs> yeah right there so that people become <laughs> um sand people from the inside like uh Rishi smith character like rasmussen yeah yeah like maybe that is a way to do it but just big clobbering sand monsters and then the doctor just very briefly going oh yes that's the sleep in the corner of your eye was just like what now maybe it needed a two-parter to develop it a bit better but I could understand why a two-parter would be a nightmarish idea for the crew, considering the main gimmick of this episode is it's all POV. We've got one on this side in the box as well. Um, okay. So the, the, the main letdown for me is the monster. I think the monster's just a bit crap. Well, I, I, think, I think the costumes are cool, but they're just a bit crap. They're always lit up by flames. They're just like these washed-out orange... CGI sludges, but they're, they're practical, and so it's like, so how do they look so weird? I think the gimmick of the episode is pulled off brilliantly. I think the actual editing, the shot composition, the execution 
is amazingly done, especially because it doesn't tip its hand. It's so subtle the first time you see the POV of a character who's not wearing a head cam. I think it's Clara. Clara, yeah. Um, I actually, no, I think it's Mag uh, Rasmussen. It's either Clara or Rasmussen. You see their POV first. Like, no, yeah, I think it's Clara after she's been in the machine. In that machine, yeah. Because then they find Rasmussen in the next machine. There's just one shot where it's like, hang on, that's Clara's POV. She's not wearing a cam. It's not obvious if you're just kind of going with the flow of the episode. I need to look out for it this time because I remember watching it in, what, 2015, whenever it came out. So yeah. I, I, I need to look out for it. I think that's really well done. And I do like the idea that what we've been watching is a completely edited broadcast by Rasmussen that he's sending out there for people to find. And he's he's nudged the events how they like some of the events in the story are nudged because he made sure they went that way, including like his own apparent death at one point. Because he wanted it to be a compelling, like, oh my god, look at this this scary thing that really happened. Like, let's watch it. I can't look away. Like that's what he wants it to be. So that by the time the broadcast is finished, enough of the signal's transmitted and you're it's own... already done what it was supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. Problem is, this was done better. Five years prior, in a BBC audio release called Dead Air. That's scary, that. I think it was by I think it was by James Goss, I'm not sure, but it's a David Tennant one. Scary. <clears throat> and it's, yeah, it's, for those who don't know, Dead Air, it's Tenth Doctor, and he is talking to the microphone. Um, like, he's recording this thing, on, it's on a pirate radio station on a boat in the 60s in the middle of the ocean. And that's where the story takes place. And he's recounting the story. It's on a boat. It's even and he's recounting the story to you to pass the time. Yeah. Um, so he's it's the tenth doctor essentially reading an audio book that he's written and is recording for you. So ten does the whole thing in character as the tenth doctor, and it's him reading it too. Um, so it's the tenth doctor doing people's voices and all this stuff, and it's great. The monster is a sound creature that has to be contained. And by the end of the story, you realise you might be listening to the Tenth Doctor recall, regaling you with the story. I think this was the ending. You might, it might, you might be listening to him regaling you with the story, but the tape isn't meant to be found. He's telling it so that it's stuck it's in trapped, there. Yeah. But if you're listening to it, it it's been trapped. found. Yeah. Because the recording is preceded by it being a BBC archival audio that has been recovered and is being put out for restoration. So what you're listening to is the BBC of, we found this weird file, um, and it's this guy telling a story, so here it is for people to listen to. It sounds like David Tennant. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's, it's like, it's the, way, it's the way it's framed is that while you're listening to it, you realise by the end, oh, no, because it's not necessarily him you've been listening to by yeah. the end mm. it's the sound file talking to you it's very well done it's very creepy but it works because it's something you're meant to listen to on your phone on your ipod yeah. like you listen to it on headphones while you're trying to go to sleep it's like Ugh! i think the ending of this tries to evoke a similar thing but it's just a shame that doctor who had done something similar a few years prior that i think just hits the nail on the head better that's not to take away from how creepy the ending shot of Reese Shearsmith's face dissolving into sand is. Lovely Reese Shearsmith. I can imagine. Lovely Reese. Friend of the show. He's never seen it. He's never going to see it. Friend of the show. But like, <clears throat> you know, I can imagine kids watching this. Episode. This is. I think this is one of those where if you ask someone now who's like 12, 13, 14, like what Doctor Who scared you when you were a kid? They go, oh God, that one with the guy's face like crumbled away at the end. I think that's Jeez, an image. I Not necessarily the story, but I think that image would be something that would stick with people. Mm, I'm not sure. Fair enough. Um, I think the main... The, the, I, the, the sing the song thing at the door for the security lock is a bit weird. Yeah. Because it feels like it comes out of nowhere because we don't really get to know this crew in a way that matters. Like they, We're introduced to them at the beginning. Like Rasmussen gives them all an introduction in the data file. But we don't really get to know them. So it feels a bit out of nowhere... But the fact that there's two League of Gentlemen members involved in this, I kind of wish that the computer had gone, do the voice <laughs> to the guy instead. <laughs> Tell Mau Mau. Um, oh, you've heard it. You've heard, oh, you've heard it, yeah. Three Bluebirds! Um, so that would have been quite fun. But, uh, and obviously never was going to happen. It's also unfortunate that the wonderful Bethany Black appears in this, 
the first like openly trans actor to ever appear in the show, and the role that she's playing is a monosyllabic grunt who is horny yeah. for one of the other characters, and it's like no, like Murray Gold, Murray Gold, that's the bloody composer. Um, uh, Andy Pryor, the casting director, has not done that on purpose. Andy Pryor is a massive ally, is a part of the LGBTQIA plus community. This was not a decision made to go, all right, we'll cast the trans person. As... Do you know what I mean? And, and I would make you an a-hole, yeah. a really big a-hole. None of it is that. It's all, Bethany Black's great, really talented, and we really want her in the show. Oh, this character has to be quite big, physically big. Bethy Black is quite tall, quite big. So, brilliant. Like, yeah, you can play this part. It's just a shame that that's the first... Ro- and that's completely more just a, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, 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 it's not been done on purpose. She plays the part well, but it's like... When she it's shows not up really in, given when, enough. When she shows up in other stuff like Banana, it's like, oh my God, she's amazing. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, it would have been well, great yeah. to see her have a, a role with a bit more meat to the part in, in the show. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I would have preferred that. Um, but I think the cast do a fairly, you know, fairly decent job. I think Jenna Coleman's quite, I don't know, quite adorable in this. Clara's quite cute in this one. She's very much like quintessential companion role at this point. Like, Mark's obviously written her from the POV of if she will say Joe or Sarah Jane. She's that kind of sort of, you know, she's a Perry. She's very kind of in it and invested and quite, she's got quite a good, few good one-liners. She and the Twelfth Doctor have a bit of rapport by now that's quite yeah. enjoyable to see. Capaldi's quite good in this. I think part of what lets it down to is it's just a bunch of grey and dark corridors. It's That's what bothered me. It was corridors. Again, I thought it was unique that it was through the cameras, so like security cameras... Yeah, the, uh, the, head the, cams, the head cams, also we thought. And then later on, camera shots, but it's just from the wall. Because, of course, by this point, we know that there's a particle around that's recording all of this. I found it all quite <clears throat> confusing. I didn't really know what was going on for quite a lot of it. Because I was just like, wait, so how long are you in that pod for? Uh, you're in it briefly. And then you don't need to sleep. Uh, I think it's like you don't need to sleep for a certain period of time. I like people regularly, they go back sort of annually to sort of get their sleep or whatever. Right. In so... that little pod. Rasmussen was just hiding in one. But obviously we also know that he isn't, after the end of the story, he isn't human. So would Clara have felt really refreshed having been in? I can't quite remember. It's not like you wake up and go, oh my god, it feels like I've had loads of sleep. It's just like, oh, yeah, no, I feel really good. And you don't need to sleep for a certain period of time. That's exactly what you just said, that it's not. Oh, no, no, but I don't mean she's like, (laughs) oh my god, I feel like a million dollars. I think it's just like, yeah, no, I feel fine. I feel all right. Better than fine. I don't know. It's. But sleep is so much fun. The technology is. It's ignore the world. Yeah, it. What's it called again? It's called. Morpheus. Of course it's called Morpheus. The Sandman. Um, I'm trying to sing it this. Well, there's that in as well, isn't there? There's the whole thing of the interface. It's like, Mr. Sandman. Sandman. Bring um, me a dream. Sorry. It, fe- it feels like something that would be better suited to a more a, a more frightening story, like, say, a Bioshock kind of story. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, the where, machine, where it's, that sounds it, really it's, scary. It's still dark corridors, it's still, like, things stalking you in the dark, but there's a more colourful, nasty edge to everything. Yeah. Whereas this sort of turns into a, a, <clears throat> an, a zombie outbreak story at the end. Or maybe if there were more characters that, you know, you'd see them before they went in the machine... Yeah. And then see what they, they were like after they got out of the machine. Like, it's scary how much they rely on it. Yeah, because we have a couple of members of the, the, the crew that are like, they don't use them. There's one they that, just, that doesn't use, them. use it, yeah. Yeah, and she's just all about and, like, and organic the sand, sleep the sand and people everything. aren't attracted to that person because they, <clears> they've <throat> got no... The, the particle that they can latch yeah, onto. Exactly. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Do you want to hear my notes? Go on. Oh, you made notes for this one. Oh, go on. Yeah. This one. Okay. <laughs> Hit me. I'm sad that I didn't make notes for the others because my notes are quite funny if I do say so myself. <laughs> Yay, Reese! Yeah. It's lovely to see... Like, we've now had all three on-camera League of Gentlemen in the show. Oh, yeah. 
So that's really cool. And, and he's in an episode written by another member of the league. Yeah. So it's like, oh, that's cool. Oh, little Reese. Little tiny Reese. Do the voice. He is tiny. He's tiny. Bless him. He's wonderful. Go on. Um, uh, what am I doing? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> why are the Doctor and Clara there? Why have they appeared I think there? there is an explanation. I think there is a throwaway explanation, but I can't quite recall what it was. I don't know. I think you just have to take that as granted as it... Granted. granted. I think you just have to take that as granted as a classic Doctor Companion situation of they arrive on a random spaceship. They're like, oh, what's this all about? Like, that that has happened in... I don't think you can hold that against it because that's happened enough in, like, 50-odd years of the show. Sure. You know what I mean? Like the majority, it's been the majority before, of the Tom right. Baker era is that. Just because it's been done before doesn't mean that it's right. The majority of the most popular era of the show prior to its revival was that. It was Tom Baker and... Was Sladen just showing up yeah, places going, oh, what's this? But this is custom. <laughs> Don't quote Peter Holmes sketch outtakes. No one's going to get it. <laughs> um, what else did I write? A machine that takes away the need to sleep. The new iOS update. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. I am wrong. Um, well, because it wakes you. You were like, oh, bollocks, I didn't put the update on. <laughs> well, you'd be awake after that bloody... Alarm. <clears throat> yeah, we're recording this on the day that everyone got the first ever and hopefully only ever countrywide emergency alert test. It's uh, Sunday, April the twenty third that we're recording this. Um, so that's that. Yeah, that was I horrifying. <laughs> I don't really understand what's going on, and I said I put a little laughing emoji because I just didn't understand. Um, it, I think it was because it was one of those where it wasn't that interesting to me, so I just started zoning out. Um. Sorry. Uh, the la the leader keeps losing her helmet. Like she's like, she's got it on, got it off, got it on, got it off, got it on, got it off. And it's like, what, okay, what, what are you doing? Where's the helmet? It's not in your hands. What have you done with it? Oh my god! Oh, right, no, go on. Yeah. Sorry, I read, I read a credit thing and I was like, have I got that wrong? But no, it's because I've skipped to face the Raven Reddit to talk about that. <laughs> uh, I've also said it's very dead space. Yeah. Uh, the fact we don't really see them kill any of the creatures properly, though, kind of takes away the notion of we have to fight them. back. They, you know, fall apart and then they don't come back. Because they get some of them get set fire to, don't they? But I don't think we see them die. We just hear them screaming. I don't know. Can you set fire to sand? I guess that, that's how you make. Well, it's not sand, is it? Glass. Isn't it's it? it's eye gunk. They're called sandmen. Mister Sandman. Anyway. Uh, Flint Marco. He's a small time cook. Small time cook. <laughs> I put sleep, really? If you were to collect all the sleep you accumulate over a lifetime, you'd probably not even fill a bucket. Yeah. So, let alone a massive monster. And I put, also, gross. Yeah. So that's my opinion. <laughs> we don't love it. But I think it's nowhere near as bad as everyone says it is. It's boring. It is boring. Unless you're her, in which case. <laughs> she says it's bad. Face the raven! Ah! 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 Um, the Trap Street Story, written by Sarah Dollard. Uh, I really like the script of this one. I like this one. I like the, the idea of uh, like the tackling themes of xenophobia and racism and, and you know, um, paranoia. Yeah. I think that works really well. I love the idea of a Trap Street. Yeah, I'd love that. Like, based on sort of a real notion, but then like, you know, they exist. You just... They're in the little gaps that people can't can't quite that explain. That you don't notice, yeah. Yeah, like that was great. And I think bringing back Riggsy was a great idea because Jovian Wade is a fantastic performer. Like, to have him be in two episodes where it's like he is clearly given, you know, room to to work yeah. is a good idea. Um, he's so good in this that dude got cast in Doom Patrol as Cyborg and has been playing Cyborg in Doom Patrol no ever way, since. No that's yeah. well good. Um, uh... It, I like how um, I like how they found it. So they had to count the steps, and if they suddenly like lost count or something, or like don't remember where they're up to, mm. that it's around that area, the entrance of it. Yeah. Because you, you, it's like you just walk past it, and you may have seen it, but because you've walked past it, you forget. I, I love, think I think that's a really interesting idea. I love the idea of it being the mystery of apparently I've been sentenced to death for a crime I don't remember committing. Yeah. And there's a cat. There's a tattoo on my neck that is counting down That's to my death. Very creepy. Very creepy. I love the notion of people passing on the guilt and the sent. Sorry, the sentence, um, and the way that like Clara utilizes that. She's like, "Oh right, we'll do it," and doesn't think of the consequences because she was under uh, what's its me's protection. 
Yeah. And she was she like, was I'll like, be well, fine then. You can turn it off then, can't you? It's like, no, that's not how it works. Also, he's now been cleared. Like, he has been, he has been pardoned. So if he still had it, he wouldn't die. Yeah. But you've got it now. And the shade, the raven, has been promised a meal. Like, it's been promised to kill. Yeah. Um, I love the idea that we're only seeing a raven because it just fits the thematics of the street. I like the idea that they stop people from fighting and infighting amongst, like, warring races and factions by everyone just looking like a human instead. Yeah, everyone looks cool. like a part, a person of this planet. It was a bit. It was a bit weird. It's weird when you're like, why would a Cyberman be here? Why would a Cyberman be helping a, a Sontaran? Well, it doesn't know, does it? Oh, I guess yeah. That's the point, but it, it's it's oh, sort I of. I thought it was only like the doc. It, that's only how it appeared to. Yeah, well, there's a perception that everyone doesn't quite see everything the way it is exactly, and even if they do figure it out, because obviously they can have conversations that can work things out, but if they do, the pact is. You do not bring any violence or outside feuds into the trap street because if you do, you will be executed. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, okay, like no sideman's going to go, we will use this as a strategic base of operations because it's like the moment they get a whiff that that sideman's got an ulterior motive for this community, they'll just kill that sideman. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, it's like, you, you obviously want them to have recognisable aliens, but it's also like, oh, that's... Uh, it's also the fact that when they scan them, it's just sometimes just a press shot. Yeah. So it's a bit like that's annoying. It <laughs> it could have been like it could it's so like you remember like that like, been... like that shot on the DVD when Amy went through the other companions or whatever. And it, no, hang on. No, where the doctor's picking the interface of the TARDIS to talk to him, and it cycled through some of the recent companions, but it was like press shot of Free Rancher for Series Three, press shot. Of... Like, why would you be so like? Yeah, like press shot of <laughs> Catherine Tate for Series Four. It's like um. They could have so easily made it into like a um, a troll market, or well, I mean, Rings of Akaten. They could have sort of reused that same kind of, yeah, kind of thingy, thing, but yeah. I, but I get it. You know, I think it works well. I think the Trap Street set is great. It's so great they use it in the immediate next story after this series as a different location. Um. I think the script is good. I think the story's biggest weakness is me. Oh, you had nothing to do with it. I know. No, I, I think the moment <laughs> a shielder shows up is yeah, just like... It, it, there's not been enough time yeah. for it to be effective. And it also feels like... Um, wait, why is she like a a sort of gangster running a haven trap strip? Well, you know, the Doctor like leaves people behind so I'm kind of his I'm kind of his enemy I'm dealing with all the crap he won't deal with because Why? he's but it's like huh what? what I don't understand huh and it's made me realise the story of a shielder would work a million times better if it was the arc of the season yeah not the hybrid get rid of that shit the arc of the series should have been in story one Especially because that'd be the, the the story everyone watches because everyone always watches the premiere episode of a series more than... The viewing figures are always higher at the start of the series. Mm. Make series one... Ep, series uh, nine, episode one, be The Girl Who Lives. Yeah. Because then everyone tuning in for the pilot will suddenly get the... Oh, yeah, that's why he's the same actor as, as that other part. That's why... Okay, instead of dumping it mid-season... Um, and then what you've done is that whole thing of the rest of the series could be she is in every episode and it's them having to follow her through time for whatever reason. Yeah. Or like they keep bumping into her and it's like, right, what the hell's going on? I mean, yes, it does mean you'd limit it to most of the stories being on Earth, but that's fine because at this point there hasn't been a season like that since season one, ten years prior. Mm. So, because series one is all stories on Earth or stories on a space station above Earth. And that's for budgetary reasons. Yeah. But it also works for that series because it keeps yeah. things grounded. And then yeah. series two, we go further. Exactly. Um, so, like, that would work fine. And it's like, well, maybe Maisie Williams wasn't available. Are you kidding me? She is in... Four episodes of this series. She's in four of them. Michelle Gomez isn't physically there recording for every episode of series eight, but there's still a little bit of Missy throughout most of every episode of the series. Like, there's a way to do it. I don't know. And we'll get into her purpose being really annoying to I mean, me we, we, when we move into the finale, but... 
We've talked about it. We've talked about it before that it's just. It's if we were watching it as it was going out live, which I was. <laughs> yeah, we we are just going. Oh. Yeah, every time she rocked up, I was like, again, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Steely. Every time. Um, there's some nice supporting actors in this, playing all the different various parts. Um, really distracting to see Letitia Wright. That was really distracting. Uh, yeah. Because it's another case of, oh shit, they're in like massive movies. Oh, not yet. Okay, yeah, they weren't at this point. Okay. Um, don't know how I feel about the visual effect of her having the face on the back of her head. I don't think it works well. Give it a mask. No, like, you when you do that with a practical effect, you either have to go a little bit shoddy and everyone buys into it, see Zaphod Beedlebrox in the say, Hitchhiker's you, you show. You can't avoid it looking like Zaphod. Or you try to go ultra-like, believable, but compartmentalised like Zaphod Beedlebrox in the 2005 movie, where it's Sam Rockwell's face under his chin, under a mm. scarf, and it just looks a little too, like... It looks like you've tried to find a middle... Like, you've tried to find a middle ground, but it just and instead disturbing. it creates something disturbing, which really sucks, because Sam Rockwell, what fucking great casting for that role. But anyway... Um, it's a shame, because all I can remember is how creepy it looked. Yeah. And the, when they remove his head, of course, then that means they remove a chunk of his neck, essentially. Do they remove it? Yeah, because... Um, um, who's Bill Nye? No, not Bill Nye. Who's John Malkovich in it? He takes his head as like a as like a payment thing of like we take it and you go do that and you can have it back. It's uh, I don't know. That film's so weird because it's like it's mostly perfectly cast it's, and it and it looks brilliant and it's just it's too Hollywood, which is weird because Douglas Adams definitely worked on it. He worked on the original screenplays, and he of all people was happy for every version to be completely different in some way, either tonally or, like, humour style. So he probably would have been like, yeah, no, I like this. This one's valid as well. But everyone else was like, it just feels a bit weird. Well, um, wrong. Also, has the League of Gentlemen in it. Exactly, I was yeah. just going to say that. Um, Steve physically, and then Steve, Mark and Reese Berkeley. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Bill Bailey as the whale falling to earth is one of the finest bits of casting Hence ever. Thanks for all the fish. Um... Face the Raven's ticking clock motif and and arc uh, and and gimmick is utilised very very well, especially when Clara realises, oh shoot, I have to die now. And to Jenna Coleman's credit and Sarah Dollard's credit in the writing, I am absolutely convinced that this is the perfect out for this character at this point. Yeah. Clara goes, oh my god, he's right. I have basically become more reckless. But no, that's my choice. Mm -hmm. I like that she tells him to not blame himself. I hate that it becomes very Moffaty and she's like, shut up! Shut up! Like, I hate that. I hate when she tells people to shut up. It's so annoying. Um, but I love the way she and Capaldi play that conversation. And the whole duty of care thing, where he's like, I have a duty of care. And she's like, no, you don't. Shut up. Hate the shut up. Love the idea that she's like, I, I am a person. I have made these decisions. Yeah. I'm an adult. I have chosen to do this. I love that she faces it with dignity. I love that she, there's that moment of utter terror on her face for just a split second before the raven flies into her. I think that's played fantastically. I love the notion that they have to get through this because Riggsy has a partner and a child to get home to. Very cute. Who know nothing of this. Yeah. Like, I, I love that. I, th I think it and was then a, the ending happens. I think Sorry. it was a bit gratuitous to have it like have it that moment played over and over again. Yeah, at different angles. Like, I understand guys. that with coverage of like a practical effect, but this is Jenna Coleman just going "huh" and a digital raven flying into it's her. Like, uh, Though there was a practical raven used in the filming. Um, hence why it gets name? a lot of hero shots. Oh, I know, Greg probably. Oh. Um, yeah, I just the ending ruins it because Capaldi gets that brilliant bit where he's like. I am going to absolutely wreck your shit to, to me, which is understandable, because the whole thing has been done to get him there. Yeah. All of this. Riggsy's life has been threatened to get him there. Yeah. He is rightfully mad. But the TARDIS is taken from him. Um, he has that thing clamped around his wrist that will take him away, teleport him to whoever orchestrated this, and then he's sent away. This story on its own is great. I think 
the best comparison, it's not, I don't think it's as good as this episode, but its best comparison is um, Utopia. It's subtly a part one of three. Like, you know, um, Martha, Captain Jack and the Doctor meeting Professor Yana and oh, the yeah, settlement. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You don't, it works as its own episode with a cliffhanger, but it's also basically part one of three. Yeah. That feels different from parts two and three because it's sort of a set a lead into it. Yeah. I you think can this, watch it without being like, ooh, what's the next part? Yeah, it That's doesn't feel like it's... It doesn't feel like... Like, you could watch part... Yeah, anyway, it, it's... It's a it's a it's a prologue episode, and and both of them are very very effective stories. Mm. I just hate where this leads, really. Um, shall we talk about Heaven Sent? Yes. It makes me think of Lame Is. <laughs> what? When um, when uh, Jean Valjean is singing, let him live. Heaven, I mean, it's just what just when he says, "Heaven sent, heaven blessed," it just that's just what it makes me think of. Okay. So that's what I think of the episode. I'm I, I'm going to blow everyone's minds here. You really didn't like this one. I thought it was boring. I thought it was boring. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was so excited to watch it because you built it up so much that it was like one of your favourite episodes. Oh no, it's not one of my favourite. I just said this is, the consensus is this is one of the best oh, ones. I remember it, you saying that you no. it was one of your No, oh no, it's not one of my favourite. It's, it's, if you said to me, what 12th Doctor episode is your favourite, I'd probably say this one. Yeah. Because it's a really good showcase of Capaldi in the role. But. Oh, I, w I was dead And I do excited. like this one a lot. I like it a hell of a lot. I was dead excited to watch it. And then when I saw it, I was like, well, I there was a moment about 20 minutes in where you went, but what was that thing on the wall, though? And I was like, what are you talking about? You're like, there was like a, I don't know, it was, it was like, you'd find it in like the, a national trust. It'd be like a big thing on the wall that sort of was like a, this, a quote from someone something. who lived yeah. in the castle or, or like a, a display with some info on. I was like, what are you talking about? So it's well the beginning when he first leaves that chamber. And, like, it's when he's at the monitor. It's when he first sees the monitor and he sees the POV of something and he realises it's the thing across the way. Um, behind him is this big, massive, like, National Trust-esque plaque on the wall that's like, this is the, the battlements and here would be... And you can never see it. It's always out of focus, but it really pulled you out of it for about 20 minutes. No, it is, You're in, like, the what is that it is in the episode. It though. is in the episode. But it really pulled you out of the episode for, like, 20 minutes because you were like... What is that though? Is that a clue? Is it something to do with? It's the... weird that it was there. And yes, it says... it's the only bit of decoration in the whole castle that isn't thematic. It's so weird, isn't it? I get it, but it really pulled you out as we watched it. Yeah, because I wanted because <laughs> I wanted them to reference it and see what it was, mm. and may maybe he didn't understand it at first. But then maybe it was a billboard that said. To... Hi, Doctor. This is a past version of you. I've just written this all out. Basically, go straight to this room and start punching this fucking wall. I Maybe grab a chair from another room and just start hitting this wall. I can't remember what it said. It didn't say anything. It did. It did. I looked it up. Oh, yeah. It did say something. That's why I was so annoyed that uh, it wasn't referenced. Because it was like, what does it say? I had to... It, it did bother me. I had to um, go back and look it up. Cause, what cause, it said cause, was because you were you were insisting that it was real and it was it know, was it's there but it's not important. No, no, I was like no, no. no you it, said it, it has to it has to be something that it means something, and I was like no, no. In the well, episode, how? I was like I bet it's just some more location that they couldn't remove, which is why it's out of focus. But I looked it up, and it is something, but it's never referenced. So is, so it, why some, is it there? Is, is it something that they put there? I'm gonna look it up. No, don't, don't, don't. This is gonna this is gonna be a rabbit hole of bullshit over a sign. Let's not bother. Don't do it. I'm doing it. Don't do it. God. You carry on. Shall I give my thoughts on this episode while you do this? Yeah. I think this episode is a excellent self-contained sort of bottle episode. I mean, literally is. He's in a bottle, basically. It's a bottle episode with a really nightmarish concept and a horrid revelation toward the end that has played out brilliantly. Capaldi's fantastic, considering he holds our attention for the whole thing. I think it's really weird when people go, he's the only one in it. I'm like, no. There are three actors in this. It, he's the only character, really, but there are three actors. There is the veil, and there is Jenna Coleman as Clara, or a body double of mm -hmm. Jenna Coleman as Clara. Um, and I like 
the pacing of it. I think the fact that it is a slow burn for the most part is quite frightening because then when the veil shows up, it suddenly gets really tense because you're like, oh God, oh God, how's he going to get out of this one? Um, I like that the monster is essentially a... It is called, referred to as the veil, isn't it? The veil in the credits, yeah. I like the fact that the veil is... It's death, but it's also not... Like, it represents death. It feels like death. But it's also a nightmare from his childhood. It's the body of someone that wasn't, like, covered and stuff, and it was surrounded by flies, and you could see, like, the corpse under the veil. And that's the whole point, is it's, like, it's this... It's this, this decrepit old woman kind of creature, is what it really is, and it's what childhood doctor and his friends would have, like, imagined this to be. This yeah. is the nightmare it he's became. He's got to admit the, the thing he's scared of. Yeah. So I found it. Go on, so is it part of the actual location? So Radio Times analysed it, apparently. Oh, Jesus. They According were bored. to them, the writing reads, As you come into this world, something else is also born. You begin your life and it begins a journey towards you. Wherever you go, whatever path you take, it will follow. You will notice a second shadow next to yours. Your life will then be over. The Doctor says that. He says that in the episode. He talk. He talks about life. Do you remember? There was. A, he gives a monologue about that. He he speaks this these words. Yeah, that's apparently what's on the wall. Yeah. So they didn't bother focusing on it because it was in the episode somewhere. How random. It bothered me. I do love that. I do love that monologue as well. The whole like um, you will like like one day you will notice a second shadow and your life will then be over. Like I love that notion of death as this thing that is always following. And I think again. The direction is it Rachel Talele directed this one. It's very deep. Yeah, I think that's done beautifully. Like the the pacing of this is great. I love the the mystery of the, the fresh set of clothes by the fire, and then obviously you realise later it's because it's from a prior him who's gone through this already. Uh, I love the despair that sets in as a viewer when you realise during that montage toward the end. How long has he been here? Yeah. Because the only noticeable change is the the fresh skull in the, in the what do you call it? How the, does the skull the get there? He knocks it over. Yeah, like, but how does it, it get there? Oh, because he, uh, I can't remember now. It wasn't just at the top. Like, I'm pretty sure it was carried. But, like, every time it's it ends up in that spot. Um, but, like, the fact that the, the only changes really are the skull... A fresh set of clothes being put by the fire. Yeah. Uh, uh, warmed by the fire. And the diamond wall having... A little bit etched, less. Like, barely etched away each yeah. time. Um, and also the dust in the chamber where he, where he arrives. Which we realise is his ashes. But of course it blows away a little bit each time and everything. So it's like, you know... It's not too much of it. It's not a long change. It's just a change that occurs. Subtle that you wouldn't notice unless you were looking for it. Yeah. Um, I, lo I love the pacing. I think it's a great, horrible, horrid little story. I just hate two things about it that stops me liking this as an episode. It's like, oh God, I'm going to put that one on. One, the hybrid. The fact that it's all about... So there's a hybrid. Someone wants to know what the hybrid is because apparently the Doctor knows what the hybrid is. So that's why they put him here. Right, well, who's put him here? Well, we're going to learn that it's the Time Lords. The Time Lords have trapped him in here because they want to know what the hybrid is. So you're telling me that the priority of the Time Lords, who the last we heard of, were free, had escaped the Time War... And were contained in a pocket universe, safe because from everybody. A pocket universe which briefly tried to reach out on Trenzalor in the town of Christmas through the cracks in time. And now we learn the cracks in time were made by them, not by the TARDIS. Expl Stephen really shat the bed in in um, Time of the Doctor. But like, so the Time Lords are like, hey, we need, we need you. We need to know you're on the outside so you can help get us out, right? That's what they're saying. In this... His confession dial is given to him at the start. Is given to Missy at the start of the series. The Doctor's last will and testament it means the Doctor is going to die, and the confession dial has been handed to his best friend, in this case the Master, so that someone has it. Right. Right. But it's not his confession dial. 
in terms of like a last will and testament, here are the things I want to say to everybody after I'm gone. It's a trap. It's a freaking mini universe like castle trap thing where they want him to confess. And every time he confessed something, the monster stopped. Like you said, every time he confessed a thing that he is afraid or that he knows what the monster is, like what it, or at least what it looks like, every time he confessed something, the monster stopped. Because the whole point of this trap is to be like, just tell us what we need to know. Or you're just going to die over and over again. That's the point of it, right? So why is his TARDIS in there? Or does the TARDIS just represent his escape? I guess that's what it represents. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's what's behind the glass, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not physically there, is it? Because he's not physically there, not necessarily. Yeah. Unless he is. Is he? He dies a billion times. So, like, is he there and being rebuilt every time? Or is this some kind of, like, suspended state of being? It's all taking place in this little disc. It's in um, the Matrix, isn't it? Well, that's an implication. The Matrix could be conjuring this world in the confession dial. But, like... Why? So they can find out what the hybrid is. This arc that is so loosely and poorly planted throughout the series. You're telling me the Time Lord's like, right, we're still alive. We need to reach out to the Doctor to get us out of the pocket universe. Oh, that didn't work. I know, let's all worry about this prophecy no one has ever mentioned before. I think one of the reasons... To the point where Razalon is like, tell us, like, you have to tell us or I'll kill you. Also, Razalon's, <laughs> Razalon's here. And he's regenerated. Because I guess they didn't want to like book Timothy Dalton to make one last appearance. Maybe Timothy Dalton read this and was like, "What? What the hell?" I think is they going just assumed on? he'd be busy. Let's be honest. And the thing is, Donald Sumpter, who plays him, is a fantastic actor and a great casting for him. Um, but he's the character's credited as the president. He's mentioned as Razalon. He refers to himself as Razalon, but he's credited as the president. It's like, okay. We're sort of talking about the two stories here now. But the, the reason I'm talking about it is because this is my beef with Heaven Sent. It ends with him coming out of the confession dial, talking to random child in desert, going, Tell them I've arrived. Go to the capital. Tell them I've arrived. And then he leaves with the confession dial. He's like, right, whoever you are, you're probably still listening. I know who the hybrid is. The hybrid, the great uh, warrior, born of two warrior races. It's me. And that's how the episode ends. And you're like, what? So, if you'd have just said that at any point during one of those life cycles, then technically they would have let you out. <laughs> I don't get... I think one of the reasons why I didn't like it is because I'm not invested. But then, I in the next really episode, care. in the next episode, he's like, I have no freaking clue what the hybrid is. I have no clue. And my head's just going, I don't care anymore. <laughs> can we just, can we, can we just plough through into Hellbent? Yes. Yeah. I hate Hellbent. Hellbent is the reason I will never say Heaven Sent is like one of the best. Because part two of its story Exists. is the worst finale of this show up to this point in the modern era, for my money. Hellbent is dreadful. So what happens in Hellbent? Uh, the Doctor's like, Dunno. we've got to bring Clara back because she can help me figure out the hybrid problem. And then you realise he's messing with the Time Lords so he can resurrect Clara... Because he feels bad about the circumstances that led to her death. He feels that duty of care. So he has her brought back at the moment of her death, which is a thing the Time Lords can do, and they do it if they need some crucial information from somebody. Her heartbeat doesn't exist, because she's basically from a frozen moment in time. And then he's like, right, we're running away, bye. And she's like, I'm meant to go back there. He's like, no, you don't. No, it's fine. Like, we'll just keep running. I'll be fine. Knowing eventually, either the universe is going to tear itself apart because something's gone horribly wrong. Or, she's going to live on, but they're going to be panicked the entire time that she could die any minute. Like, it's just, it's, it's a... I, I, don't, I don't... Like, I don't believe that the Doctor cares so much for Clara that he would risk the universe's existence. I don't buy it. I don't buy it for a second. Does he miss her? Yes. Is this going to rip him to shreds? To shreds, shreds you say? Shreds. Absolutely. Then go and meet her at a slightly earlier point in her life when you two are still hanging out 
and go on a random adventure with her and have your closure with her thinking it's just you having popped in. Because her entire thing is he just pops up and picks her up and they go on adventures, which is so annoying. Like, just do that then. Do that. Like, I just... I uh. And the fact that he's not only willing to risk the universe, but he starts it by murdering the Time Lord General so that they can get away. It's like... He? Yeah, he shoots him. He, he pulls the gun on him, and the General, who is played by Ken Bones, returning from the 50th anniversary, um, is like... He, the Doctor asks him, he says... He's just like, which regeneration? And he's like, ninth or whatever. He's like, right. And then he shoots him. Oh, yeah, yeah, Because yeah, he yeah, yeah, regenerates yeah, into yeah. the wonderful Tania, Tania Miller, who should have been playing the Doctor at some point. There's still time, but come on. Um, into Tania Miller, who makes a quick joke about like, oh, God, like, thank God for that. That was the first time I've been a man and I hated it. And it's like, you know, okay, fun little joke. I remember people on the internet, the easily offended people who say that everyone are easily offended getting really shitty about that online at the time. But it was like, oh, piss off. Um, I'm more offended that it's just a waste of Tanea Miller. Um, but maybe we'll get a Colin Baker and it'll be like, yes, yeah, so she played a Time Lord General and that means she can be the Doctor later. Screw it. Um, but like the Doctor executes somebody and then when Clara's like, you killed him. And he's like, oh, it's the Time Lords. Like, regenerating is just like having a bad case of the flu. You're like, no, you... You still executed them. You straight up killed that guy. You murdered them. Like, shoot the lights out or something and scramble in panic. Um, what's the name of the the Under the Matrix area again? Can you remember? Is it the, right. clo- is it the Cloister something? Cloister... Shop? The, the Cloister Meet and Greet. <laughs> <laughs> the Cloister Cluster... Oyster restaurant. <laughs> oh god! I don't know. Cloister oyster. Point is, you've got these. You've got these like people who got trapped. You've got these sort of clockworky time lords that are powered by like the memories of dead time lords uploaded to the matrix yeah, that have gone a, a bit wrong. There. There's a Dalek stuck in it because there's implication that other creatures tried to get down there and like steal the repository of the matrix's knowledge. Not sure what a weeping angel was going to do with the Matrix, but okay, sure. Cameos, I guess. Um, it's what they had at the time. I guess it's because they were like, we're in the finale and there's no bad guy. Should we put some monsters in it? Do you know what I mean? But like, so the Doctor's like, right, we're going to travel to the furthest point in time. In the, like, they steal a TARDIS and we're going to travel to the furthest point in time in the future. To get you away from, like... The, the, the Time Lords are at the end of the universe. I thought they were in a pocket dimension. Well, apparently not anymore. Because they could just go there. What? Huh? So he travels, to, like, even further. He travels to the end of everything so they can be as far away as possible and hopefully that'll disrupt, like, what, the signal or whatever so that she can carry on living. But it's like, and then what? And then what? But they get to the end of the universe to find everything is broken to pieces... And the only thing left at the end of the universe is me, a shielder, who's just chilling in, you know, 2015 fashion on a pair of armchairs. He's like, yep, yeah, I'm here because I knew you'd end up here. Uh, tell the tell the confession, tell the hybrid is, Doctor. It's like, the hybrid is the Doctor and Clara's relationship and how destructive it will be. Wap, wap. And we learn that that's why the master paired them up in the first place, the woman in the shop. Meaning that Missy's been running things since the Smith era to put Clara... I <sighs> Missy should have been there at the end of time. Yeah. Not, not a shielder, mm. Missy. Yeah. Why? Oh, because I know all about this and here's why I did it. No, it's a shielder. So a shielder wasn't the hybrid, the doctor wasn't the hybrid... Davros wasn't the hybrid. The Dalek hybrids weren't the hybrid. The hybrids, the hybrids, the hybrids, the hybrid, the hybrid. This is the worst story arc in the history of the show. It's so awfully set up, it's so pointlessly laced, and it pays off in the worst and most boring possible way. So harsh. Because we find out at the end that, oh... 
Clara can go on living for a bit, but one of us, for the safety of the universe, has to be removed from the equation. So we have to be made to forget the other one. So that the hybrid, which is their dangerous relationship, can't continue. What? Do you know what would save the hybrid from ever happening? Take her back and let her die? Like she's asking you to? It's just... Oh, it's so... Like, you knew your part in the prophecy, Doctor. And it turned out that, yeah, he's an idiot who tries to save his mate. Knowing it's the wrong decision. I just... It's... I say this about, unfortunately, about a lot of the stories. But imagine a kid watching this. Oh, a kid would be they'd, bored they'd, they'd be out of the room doing something else. A kid would be briefly excited by the monsters in the, in the cloister thingy. Yeah, but they wouldn't get up to that point because they would have already switched off. Maybe. No, well, they introduced them early. Remember, we see some shots of them early, like, just gliding around. The bar the fact that that barn has become a significant location is so weird. It is weird. Like the implication is it's the one he grew up in. And I, I do love the fact that like the woman there recognizes recognize him. him despite obviously having never seen him before she knows who it is. So it's like that's interesting because that implies that maybe she's the one who looked after all the wayward kids like the Shabog because they're the Shabogans as well. They're not time lords, they're girl friends. But the Shabogans are the people who live on the outskirts of nowhere and they just live in small communities. So that implies that the Doctor grew up as a lonely Shabogan child. But he didn't! Because he grew up in the Academy! As a Time Lord! With the Master. With the Master! Like, and then obviously later on it's retconned even further that like the first incarnation of the Doctor is the first life cycle that the Doctor, as far as they themselves were aware, they had. And they grew up from childhood into that that incarnation. But they had, in fact, had, like, loads prior. Um, which is completely fine, because the idea is that the Doctor was effectively reset to be this person with no memory of their past lives and whatever. And that's later stuff, so that doesn't impact this immediately. But the idea that they're saying that the Doctor was left and abandoned and grew up as an orphan child and you know, like a Shabogan uh, community in this barn in the outskirts of nowhere is contradicted by the fact that we have seen flashbacks okay, in what? this era of the show okay, of, well, the Master, but like the Doctor uh, yeah. is there as well. So it's like, huh? Um, but no, because they're in a barn because Clara had to grab their ankle. It's just like, I, uh, and this barn's important. It's the one from the day of the Doctor. Is it? Because it's completely different shape on the inside, and it's the one from Listen, which is a completely different shape from the one there, the Doctor on the inside. What? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. We can, we can all agree. The visual effects team do amazing work in this era. Everything looks fantastic. Sets, costumes, it looks amazing. The story misuses all of it. When it get unfortunately, when it gets to unfortunately, that's the review for Hellburn. Unfortunately, it exists. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to like Gallifrey and anything to do with time um, lord society, uh, Razalon, Razalon, and things like that, I'm just I'm not interested. Which is weird because the last time it was prominent uh, for Razalon, tenants finale, and for Gallifrey, the fiftieth. You were. Yeah. It's interesting as hell. It's like, let's go. And then the end of time, at the end of time, time of the Doctor puts it, punts it further down the road a bit by being like, we found a way to free Gallifrey, but everybody's braced and ready to destroy it the moment it arrives. Yeah. Then we have to keep it hidden longer. And the, and the Time Lords give him a new life cycle to be like, oh, go protect us and we'll come find us later. Yeah. But then this happens. This is the eventual thingy of that, and it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Donald Pleasance is a fantastic... Is it Donald Pleasance? It's not his name. Donald Sumter. Donald Pleasance is from Halloween. Donald Sumter is a fantastic actor. Donald Sumter. So, can we learn more about what's happened with Razalon? Why is Razalon regenerated? Did the Master kill him when they went back into Gallifrey in, at the end of time? Like, why is it a different Razalon? What's going on? We never learn. Now, there are some great moments in this story. I like the bit where all the soldiers respect what the Doctor did 
to help save Gallifrey. Yeah. And they all, as the firing squad, just put their guns on the ground and go and stand by him instead. I love that scene. I love Razalon's like absolute fury that no one is listening to him. Yeah. I think that's great. Um, I like that the the guards like arm, the armor and everything is sort of like a more combat version of what Colin Baker and Co wore in the Fifth Doctor era and stuff. Well, obviously there it was a bit more kind of superhero y kind of cloth cloth watches, but the helmets all come from the same place. It's still the red and silver colour schemes. Like I like that, I think that's cool. Um I <sighs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, and I I don't hate the wraparound because the opening scene of this episode is genuinely really compelling. With the kids. No, no, the opening scene of this episode, that's the end of the last one. Oh, the opening scene of this episode where the doctor dressed slightly differently with just a guitar arrives at a diner in the middle of the desert in the States present day. Oh yeah. Goes into the diner playing a song on his guitar that he knows is called Clara and he's trying to remember this thing that's happened to him and he tells the story to a diner worker who is to us obviously Clara yeah who is also talking to him like you know oh hi stranger like she doesn't know him so it's like what's going on is this one of her splinters are we doing that again but by the end of the episode we realise no he got dropped off here she basically stuck around just a tiny bit longer to make sure he was going to be okay and set him off on his way and dropped off the TARDIS which is where we last saw it in the post credit scene of Face the Raven like it's in the same state. It's it's been graffitied by Riggsy with a memorial to Clara on it, which was a beautiful little nod post credits to Face the Raven. I forgot to mention that. That's such a sweet little after the credits, just that. Yeah. And you're like, oh, meaning that it's been stuck there for a while because Riggsy's obviously tagged it and drawn a memorial on it. Um, a memorial which fades away in this the moment he walks up to it like crumbles away yeah it blows away and then he gets his shit sonic screwdriver the worst one ever designed tell me what it looks like it's the blue sort of like pointy one that has multiple different light settings and the handles all like coggy and everything it's awful the reason you don't remember what it looks like is because we don't own it ah. I've never bought the toy because it's dreadful um it's so awful. And the way that the TARDIS makes it for him and just like fires it out. And it's this weird cheesy shot of, look at the new thing, look at the new thing, look at the new thing. And then he grabs it. And it's like, oh God. And then the toy wasn't even ready to go. If they were sensible, the toy would have been available that week. Yeah. But it wasn't. That's, wow. Yeah. So, and the fact that Clara and the shield, that Clara's like, I do have to go back. I don't have to go back just yet. So she and a shielder have a TARDIS. And I'm just gonna... So the whole thing that Clara was saying that, you know, she needs to go back, she needs to die to set this right. She's suddenly like, ah, fuck it. Pretty much. Now, she will die. She has to go back. And we know she dies. Because in Twice Upon a Time, there's something that happens that confirms that she had to have died. So it, she does go back. But that means that a shield is out there with a... Type 40 or Type 44 or whatever TARDIS, just travelling around the universe in a diner. And it's like, okay. That kind Moffat of... Moffat is scared of dying. Absolutely. Steve is frightened of dying. No characters truly dying in his shows. Do -do, do -do, do -do, do -do. At least in terms of main characters and supporting characters, none of them ever really ever die. No. Spoiler alert. For the episode we're about to watch. Which is a very good one, to be fair. A character will die in this one we're about to watch. That character will then show up in the immediate next special after it. Alive. Um, you know how at the end of this, Clara and Ashilda travel off into the stars to have their own adventures? Yeah. That's how That's Bill the leaves the show. Um, Bill and Heather travel off into the stars to have their own adventures. What is the need of the Doctor anymore? Amy and the Rory. Amy, Amy, Amy and the Rory. The Rory. Amy, it's because you said the Doctor. I tripped up. <laughs> Amy and Rory live on in New York, having their own full life and adventures. None of them ever actually die when the show is like they're dead now. Just, and that can be played for tragedy, like Donna. 
the Donna Noble we know is dead. Pre that Donna is the one who's still around. And she's Donna's alive. Dead. No, but like the Donna, Donna we, the Donna we know is dead. Why is she dead? Because her memory had to be erased. Oh, I see. The right, Donna, sorry, the Donna, sorry, sorry. the Donna that thought, you know, um, got married and nearly got married and fought the Ragnos and became a little, you know, snoop and investigator and sleuth of her own and met the Doctor again and had these incredible adventures is dead. She will never come back, right? Yeah. We say this in April of 2023, by the way. November, holler at us. But she will never come back, right? Like, she's gone. Yeah. Rose is not reachable. She is separated. She is gone. You know what I mean? Like, all the ones in this era are perfectly fine. Don't worry about them. Which is fine, because you could argue, well, Donna at least is alive. Rose is alive and has a life and a doctor of her own eventually, you know. But it's like, yeah, but the more you do that, the less tragic it becomes. Yeah. And with Moffat, the more obvious it becomes when you have characters like Rory who die repeatedly, only to then not be dead. Um, and that happens again here. Clara will die. She's not yet. She'll pop back. She'll pop back. It's fine. She'll pop back. The hybrid is the worst story arc and it leads to some of the worst scripts of this series. I think a shielder is ultimately a nothing character. Is that over now? What, a shielder? No, no. Um, the... the hybrid. Yes. Okay. It's a season nine thing. So is a shielder. She'll never return. Um, Even if she wants to, she'll never return. Peep, peep. Yeah. Uh, they can't afford it now. Um, but yeah, so... What do you guys think? Are you surprised at these reactions? I think people are going to be like, you like Sleep No More? You don't like Heaven Sent that much? You really hate Hellbent? Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry. Season nine, I think... Up to this point, this was the worst season of the modern show. Six has a lot of duds, but it has a few really heavy hitters in there. Do you know what I mean? And also, there's a more obvious, electric, enjoyable chemistry between Smith, Gillen, and Darville. Yeah. That is just, even in their worst stories, they are a delight to watch together. Um, I, think, I think Coleman and Capaldi are very strong together in this series. Once she's treating him less like a taxi and we're just joining them on adventures. You know? Yeah. Once their relationship is a lot more in sync, they're, they're very enjoyable to watch. And again, her saying bye to him in Face the Raven, her... Oh my, some of her best acting is in Hell Bent, where they're like trying to get into the lower part of the Matrix and she's just crying talking to like that scene is she acts her arse off in that scene you remember they knelt on the floor and like he's trying to get into the grid and there's all the stuff swirling around him no and it's just a quiet moment no the, this rewatch has made me realise she's a brilliant actor I just don't like the characters the character I don't like Clara yeah I think Coleman is a fantastic performer. I don't like Clara. Um, I, I do agree. In the, in the same way that, like, I think Martha's brilliant, but Freema Adjuman's skill just wasn't quite there yet. Do you know what I mean? Like, I like Martha a lot more than I like Clara, but Adjuman's performance is a bit... That's a bit of a weird place to pitch it. In places. But, like, I also understand she's a great actor and she has gotten even better the longer she's gone on in her career working on stuff like Law and Order and Sex and the City prequel and all this stuff like she's really honed her skill but Martha is also a much better written character yeah than Clara whereas here is it's a great actor who's probably at the top of her game but the character just uh, no she goes through so many phases of, you know, being a badass and then she's annoying, she's rude, she's, you know, inconsiderate, but then she's, like, the most passionate person in the world and then it's just a bit exhausting mm. just trying to keep up with all of it. Like like the Twelfth Doctor, she's inconsistently written. Yeah. And that's not her fault. It's not her fault. It's not Coleman's fault and I don't think it's Capaldi's fault. I just... 
And it's not necessarily Stephen's fault. Like, it is Stephen. It's his job to maintain the characters through the scripts. The role of the showrunner is to go over everyone else's scripts and kind of be like, right, I mean, I'm going to change this bit. Can you change that bit? To make sure that everything has a, uh, has a, a consistent yeah. vibe to it. Um, series 9 as a whole. Any stories that you're like, oh, I quite like that one. I think I think both of us unanimously our favourite was Under the Lake Before the Flood. Yeah, yeah, because that, that was spooky. Yeah, and I think if we had to pick like a single episode, I think we'd probably both say Face the Raven. Yeah, like it's it's a really solid like forty five minutes for the most part. Yeah, um, I'm grateful for certain things. Like I'm so glad we got to see Julian Bleach's Davros again. Yeah, even though the story was shite. Um, you know. I think the Zygon story is is a lot better than I, I remember feeling about it initially. Um, I just wish everyone had calmed the feck down about the speech at the end. Because the point of it is brilliant, but like it's not the solution to war, folks. It's not how things are going to resolve. It's not that easy. Posting it on Twitter will not resolve world conflict. Um, I, I'm just not a fan. Of the series overall, I thought it was the you know, the the spooky one. Mm-hmm. That was do you mind. That was the most like how how to describe it. That one made my heart beat. Which one? The 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 uh, the ghosty one under the under the lake before the flood. Yeah. yeah, that one you know got the got the blood pumping. But I don't know the rest of them. It was just a bit like yeah 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 enthusiastic enthusiastic. Oh, I'm bored now. Again, like self-contained, the girl who the girl who lived, uh, the girl who died, self-contained. It's great. That is good. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of fun. Is that this series? Yeah, that was this series because okay. it's a shielder. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, but the woman who lived, not okay. great at all. Like, just yeah, it's a weird one. Um, a little preview of what's to come, my dear sweet lady. Oh, you're talking to me now. Yes, and obviously to you. Look, you'll find that too. Up next, we have one last story that's in this box set. We will be watching... Uh, it's in this box, isn't it? Are they both in here? No, it's just this one's in here. We will be watching The Husbands of River Song, which is the 2015 Christmas special. Yeah, you like this one, don't you? I like this quite a bit, yeah. Um, it's got some annoyances in it. Uh, Matt Lucas's performance, for example, in this is no. awful. But I have a retroactive forgiveness of Nardole as a character because when we get more Nardole, he's so much better. And Lucas plays it a lot more subdued in a way that is really enjoyable. Whereas in this, he's a bit too doofy. Um, I like this one a lot, but we'll talk about it when we watch it. Obviously, then, there's a skip. There's no Doctor Who for a year in 2016 until Christmas with the return of Doctor Mysterio. But before that, something else happened. A whole series of another thing happened. (sighs) I am not going to subject this poor woman to that whole series. But she is going to watch the first and last episode with me. So join us soon for our review of The Husbands of River Song, followed by The Class Retrospective. Oh, goody. Yay for me. If I had to suffer for it, you have to suffer for it too. I must say, it makes me laugh because it makes me think of Five Who fans. That's why... This that's was the room that the class premiere video was shot in. Yes, and <laughs> that is its that's, only saving grace. That's the opposite of what class sounds like. Um, right. We had a balloon with the words P.Ness written on it in this room for about two years. Because we kept that balloon from all the party balloon props from that sketch. We were just astounded that it was still there. And that balloon, like, it deflated... Like, over two years. That was how long it stuck around. It was wedged between a, a Blu-ray cabinet and a and corner of the wall. And we just didn't touch it because we wanted to know how long it would take for it to deflate. And, and it then, took a long time. And then one day it just wasn't there because it had slipped on the fallen on the floor because it was too thin now. And it was like, and oh. That is a metaphor for my enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. It's rained over time. Good Lord. Bye. 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 Boo.